What's up, Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day. Got rid of that cool spell that moved through here earlier this weekend, and we're back to feeling nice and moderate around here. Nice fall day here in South Georgia in the low 70s. We got some odds and ends planting to get done today. Some spots where I kind of saved some room on the edge of a few of these plots. We're gonna be getting some spinach in the ground. And then I gotta get my onion plot ready to plant. Our onions in the greenhouse, our onion transplants are ready to go. I need to get them in the ground this week, you know, middle of November. Uh, sounds just about right. Also got some bunching onions on a direct seed in the ground. So we got a lot to do today. Let me show you where we're going to be working and we'll get started. So several videos ago I mentioned to you that on these fall garden plots like this one where we just have a bunch of brassicas in here, I like to save room on the ends just in case I forget about something or I want to throw something in there. And we did that with this plot here. We saved a little room on this end where we put that cilantro dill and fennel in there a few weeks ago and then we saved enough room on this end not a ton of room but enough room to squeeze in a row of spinach right there so spinach is one of those crops i don't have a ton of experience with i've had a few successful spinach crops here and there but i haven't grown a lot of it over the years when we were market farming we didn't grow spinach just because the harvest of spinach is pretty labor intensive it doesn't get very tall you got to get down there at the dirt cut it off it takes a lot to make a bag and we just never really grew spinach because it seemed like more work than what it was worth when we were selling our vegetables and we had plenty of other stuff that we could put in the bags in the fall and winter months it wasn't as much work as spinach last year we had a really good crop of spinach in our no-till our first no-till plot right over here it took it a while to get going but once it did it was awesome and i really enjoyed having a row of spinach in the garden so we're going to do it again this year i've grown a couple different varieties i've grown one called sun angel and one called avenger both of those seem to be pretty good now when you go online different seed companies that are looking for spinach seed it's kind of like broccoli it all looks the same. It's really hard to tell the difference between any of these varieties. There's tons of different spinach varieties out there. And I'm guessing the reason is because there's all these kind of slot varieties for the commercial growers out there. But it can be hard to determine which one you should pick because spinach kind of looks like spinach, just like broccoli kind of looks like broccoli. But like I said, the Avenger has done well for me. This Sun Angel variety has done well for me. And that's the one we're gonna be planting today. Now, I don't know what the exact or the ideal soil temp is for spinach germination. I know it won't germinate in warmer soil temps. So we kind of like to wait till things cool off pretty well to plant our spinach. We wait till after we plant our carrots and all that. I probably could have planted this a week or so ago and been just fine. But from my past experiences when I was successful with spinach, Planting it in early to mid-November seemed to work out and I seemed to get pretty good germination that way. Now we don't have drip tape in this plot behind me here so we're not going to put this on drip irrigation but we are going to plant it in a double row. I really like doing that with spinach and any other thing where we're just direct seeding it really heavily and we want kind of a nice ground cover to keep any weeds from growing up in between the plants. So in this little sliver here on the end of this plot I'm going to go ahead and make a furrow with the wheel hoe. We're going to drop down some of that 855 fertilizer in the furrow. Then I'm going to close that furrow with the high arch wheel hoe and make me two little mini furrows there so we can plant a double row. I've been taking morning slowly Waking up with the sweet sound of the birds Reading books and sipping coffee I forgot how much I love getting lost in words. Okay, so we got what we need for our double row here. One row there, one row there, a little gap in the middle, which should get covered up once the foliage develops a little bit there. Now, from my little experience I do have with growing spinach, I know that you about can't plant it too thick. You want to plant it real thick, almost like we do carrots, just kind of sprinkling it along in here. And I kind of want to do it in a band as opposed to just a linear row because I want kind of a dense stand of spinach here and here. 
Now on this seed packet, it says for full size spinach, do a thousand seeds per hundred foot. For baby size spinach, baby leaf spinach, do a thousand seeds per 25 foot. I want it kind of small. I'm gonna cut it kind of small, so I'm gonna plant it thick. And um, I don't have any way to measure this out, but we're gonna try to aim for the thousand seeds per 25 foot recommendation. And with these two, with this double row, that's 30 foot long. We'll probably end up using a couple thousand seeds. We got 10,000 seeds here, so we should have a plenty. So I'm gonna just empty a few seeds in my hand here. A nice little handful. And we're just gonna start sprinkling them. <clears throat> and we're just gonna start sprinkling them along here, pretty heavy. And these two little furrows. And once we get it nice and thick, we'll just lightly cover these babies up. It's like time is falling asleep in the afternoon. Sunlight is keeping us warm. Against our will, we're finally sitting still. And savoring the days before they're gone. I wonder how it took us this long. All right, our spinach is in, quick and easy there. Now, to get this to germinate, especially in this thick layer of compost, which doesn't hold water really well at the top, I'll probably have to just hand water this row on the end here once every day or so until this stuff comes up. It's a little slow to germinate from my experience. It's a little slow to get going. So kind of the same principle with the carrots and the beets that we direct seeded probably don't want to plant this or direct seed spinach in an area where you have some really heavy weed pressure because the weeds are going to get the best of you try to pick a spot where your weed seed banks kind of low you don't have that much weed pressure because the weeds will outpace the spinach at least initially now I've had a lot of folks over the years ask me about transplanting spinach and I have tried it but I didn't really like transplanting it because it's pretty labor intensive to transplant something that close when we're planting something as thick as we want this spinach planted it doesn't really make sense for us to transplant same thing with the carrots you know we used to transplant beets because we wanted uniformly sized beets but anything we're planting super super thick like this it's much easier just to direct seed it you just got to be careful letting the weeds outpace you all right so now on to the onion plot or what will soon be our onion plot this plot is one we converted to no-till last year, last October, I believe. We grew some brassicas in here, grew pumpkins in here in the spring, grew a cover crop in here this summer, and we just added a good bit more compost here. Last time you saw this, just had a big mound on it. I waited for a cool day, got it spread out. There's a few little humps in there, but it'll be all right. It's good enough for me. Now we all know, or hopefully we all know, that onions like plenty of nitrogen. You really got to pump the nitrogen to them during that vegetative phase so they can make a lot of green leaves and that's going to end up resulting in a nice big bulb when they do start their bulbing phase. So this year I'm going to try something a little different to add some nitrogen to the soil, some more slow release nitrogen to hopefully grow some nice big onions. Now we're gonna put some Nature Safe in the furrow at planting and probably side dress with some of that 1300 Nature Safe. But I'm gonna do some of this stuff right here, these alfalfa pellets, which look like this. It's basically horse feed. But I've heard a lot of our viewers using it with success. It makes a good slow release nitrogen source. It's not fast acting by any means. You gotta put it out there ahead of time, let it break down. So what I'm gonna try to do, or what I'm gonna do, is we're just gonna scatter it amongst that whole plot right there. Cause we're gonna have onions on that whole plot, lots of heavy feeding plants on that plot. We're just gonna scatter it out there, kinda like we do a cover crop, rake it in a little bit, and uh, we'll see if it releases in time to feed them well enough. Spend our evenings telling stories, playing games like we were all All right, so we got some of that strode on that plot, got it raked in a little bit. Shouldn't go anywhere, we'll get a little rain. Should seed in there nicely. 
Now, because I've never used these alfalfa pellets before, I have no idea how much to use. I put about a half to three quarters of this five gallon bucket on that thousand square foot plot. That could be not enough, could be too much. Who knows, we'll just have to see. I do know that this stuff here is pretty cheap. It's not that expensive, so if it doesn't work, we haven't really lost anything. Maybe some of you out there have used alfalfa pellets before can tell me if I put enough or not enough on that plot. So we'll just have to see if that nitrogen releases in time to really feed those onions. We're still getting a little bit of heat during the day. Like right now, I can feel the sun pretty good. So hopefully that will help it to release once we get some moisture in the soil. I'll be able to tell once those onions get up and growing if they're being fed well enough or not. I know grown onions long enough, I know kind of how healthy those leaves should be, how many leaves we should be putting on those onions before they bulb. So I'll be able to know pretty quickly if they're getting enough nitrogen from these or if we need to supplement some more with side dressings about 1300 or something like that. We did have several folks a couple of videos ago mention they side dress their cabbage and other heavy feeding brassicas with this stuff here and it works pretty well so we'll just have to see but i'm optimistic that it's going to work and if it does work it's a really cost effective solution to feeding onions all right now we need to go ahead and put our main line down and kind of start getting our irrigation system together for when we're ready to plant these onions so we've had a lot of folks messaging us lately asking about drip irrigation, how to set it up, where's the best place to get drip supplies, all that stuff. And that's going to depend a little bit on your experience with using drip irrigation. If you've never used it before, have zero experience with it, you're probably better off buying one of the kits online, like the ones Hall sells or I think Dripworks sells some kits too. If you have used drip before and are familiar with all the components of it, you might be able to find some stuff locally that will save you a dollar or two. And once you get used to using it, it's pretty simple. So the basic components of any drip irrigation system are a filter. You gotta have a filter to keep any hard particles from getting in there and clogging those tiny holes in the drip tape. You gotta have a pressure reducer, which we see here. You gotta reduce that pressure down to 12 PSI or 10 PSI, something like that, or else you'll blow out the drip lines. You can't be running a lot of pressure through there. So. That's why we use this setup at the beginning of our drip tape setups. It looks complicated, but it's not really. It's just a connection here to hook up the water hose, filter, pressure regulator, and then this is just a little T so we can put this setup in the middle of our mainline tubing as opposed to on the end of the plot. Then you've got the mainline tubing, which is what feeds the drip tape. Now, most people, most gardens, you're gonna be fine with this stuff right here, which is called 5 8 or half inch main line tubing or supply line. Now you'll see the different measurements because some people use the outside diameter, which would be 5 8 Some people use the inside diameter, which would be half inch, but it's the same stuff. Now I found this stuff here, this Rainbird main line tubing, which is working pretty well for me so far. I can't remember if it was Lowe's or Home Depot, but I found this stuff for $10 per 100 foot roll, which is the best price I've seen anywhere online or locally. So that's what I've been using, just this Rainbird mainline tubing here. Works pretty good. And like I said, it's really cheap for a 100 foot roll. Then you've got your drip tape. And there's several different types you'll find out there. I've used this Rivulus brand before. I really like it. And I've got some of this Eartech tape that I've been using a little bit lately. I don't really like this Eartech tape as much as I like the Rivulus tape, but I have a roll of it, so I'm gonna use it. But uh, once I'm out of it, I probably won't buy any more of it. If you go online looking for drip tape, you'll find it in various thicknesses. I usually like using just an eight mil tape, works fine for my gardens. If you have a lot of rocks and obstructions in your gardens, things that could possibly poke holes in the tape, or maybe you're not as good as avoiding the tape with a hoe, then you might want to go with a thicker tape like this 15 mil tape here. It is a little bit more rigid. It's a little bit more difficult to install the connections on, but it's thicker and it will last longer and it can handle some rocks and obstructions in your soil. 
And then you'll also see variable emitter spacing when it comes to drip tape. You'll see some drip tape that has six inch emitter spacing, some eight inch, some 12 inch. I use the 12 inch emitter spacing for everything regardless of how close or how far apart the plants or the seeds are planted and it works just fine. If you're worried you don't have enough water and you got things planted real dense, you can go with a six or eight inch, but I found 12 inch. It's pretty much the standard and it works fine with everything for me. Now, as is the case with most things, if you buy in bulk, you save some money. These smaller rolls of tape here usually have anywhere from 800 to 1500 feet of tape on them. Usually cost a couple hundred bucks. You can buy the big rolls online and I can buy them locally here at a few of the farm irrigation stores. The big rolls that the commercial farmers use are 7,000 foot rolls and they're usually only about twice as much as these rolls so you get a lot more tape for not much more money. And that's gonna give you a good bit of savings if you use a lot of tape. The problem with the bigger rolls, they're heavy, they're a little harder to maneuver, and so that's something to consider there. I'm probably gonna buy a big roll once I'm done with all these little pieces of little rolls I have. I just gotta figure out a good way to transport it and a good way to kinda hold it on a spool. Probably gonna have to make me a little spool for it, but this stuff doesn't go bad, so if you can, or if you will eventually use a big roll, that's the way to go. And then as far as connecting the drip tape to the mainline tubing that I showed you earlier, it's real simple. They connect with these little things called row starts here. So the tape connects on this end, this end pops into a little hole in the mainline tubing. And then there's several different ways to terminate the ends of the drip tape at the end of each row. I like using these little caps right here. They work pretty good. Some places sell something that looks more like this that you can kind of screw into the end of the tape. Some people will just tie a knot in the end of the tape. Lots of different ways to do it. These are the easiest thing I've found and the most effective, easy to install thing I've found. So I really like these. These are what I use. And once you have these fittings, they really don't go bad. These things last forever. So this is kind of a one-time um, cost when you're buying drip tape. You want to replace the tape ever so you know a few years the main line tubing here you can usually get several years out of it you can you know plug the existing holes punch new holes in it so once you get used to using this stuff it's pretty easy there's a little bit of a learning curve to it but you know once you get used to it installing it reinstalling it it's pretty simple so we take our main line tubing here and run it along the edge of our garden plots most of the time you want to do this on the short edge of the plot so you're not having to run as many drip lines. I like to do it on this side. So then I can run a water hose right down the middle here and feed it here, feed it there. And I'm not having to snake the hose around the outside of these plots. I can feed everything down this lane right here. Now I like to put a brick on the end of these until the sun kind of works some of that memory out of this tubing, just to kind of hold them down, keep everything straight and in place. On the ends of the mainline tubing to crimp it, we just use this little piece here called a figure eight end clamp. Just slides over one end here, fold it, pull it back on there, and it's crimped. And you don't have to worry about water coming out the end of this tubing here. And then we'll just kind of guesstimate the center of our plot here to put our filter and regulator water hose hookup and all that. Now you can cut this stuff with a pocket knife, but I like this little pipe cutter here just makes it a little easier so i'm going to hold down one end with the brick there cut that and we're going to install our t right here i'm going to slide one end of it onto that tighten that down oh got away from me i'm going to put the other end on it like that Tighten that down, kind of square it up a little bit, boom. So that's the basic setup there, real simple. Just hook our water hose up to that right there. It's gonna fill that supply line or main line full of water and we can punch in a drip line anywhere we want along that main line there, put a row anywhere we want in this plot here so that we can have the tape feeding those plants. 
Now I should mention that this half inch or five eighths mainline tubing here, supply line, whatever you want to call it, that we use is restricted to rows no longer than 100 foot long. So if you have rows that are longer than 100 foot, you have to go to a larger main line, larger fittings, all that kind of stuff. So this kind of setup I do is for smaller scale gardens. If you've got really, really long rows, you got to kind of upgrade your equipment a little bit. So now that we've got the kind of skeleton of our drip irrigation set up there in place, we can go ahead and put a row in to plant these bunching onions here. Now, I don't know a lot about which is a good variety of bunching onions and which is not. I think I've only grown bunching onions one time in the past, but uh, we're gonna plant a whole row of them this year. I was on High Mowing Seeds website a while back getting some other stuff and saw this variety called Parade. Sounded like a good variety. So we went with that. The description here says a true bunching onion that will not bulb long white stems that are straight with dark green silvery tops, great for salads or as an edible garnish in soups and dishes. That's what we're going for. So these bunching onions do not bulb. Some people call them spring onions. You plant them real thick. You go out there, just kind of grab a bundle of them, chop them up, use them in soups, salads all kind of good stuff. So this will be different than the onion transplants we'll be putting in later this week where we will be getting a nice bulb. We want to plant these thick. I went ahead and bought 5,000 seeds of these because it uh, wasn't that much more to get the bulk option. The seeding rate on this is pretty thick, just like the spinach. It says 50 seeds per foot in two inch bands. So we're going to plant these very, very similar to the way we do our carrots, the way we do that spinach. We're going to sprinkle them heavily in a band. Let me get my equipment. Let me get a row laid on the end there with the drip tape. We'll put some 855 in the furrow, and then we'll be ready to plant. Probably going to do a double row of these guys too. All right, so we've got our one line of tape here installed. Got the water on. And we're going to do these just like we did that spinach. So we're going to put a row here and a row here. We got tape in the middle here, whereas we didn't with the spinach. But same concept here, planting a double row. Now, at the seeding rate of 50 seeds per foot, that's going to give me 1,500 seeds per side of this double row. So 3,000 seeds total, which is a good thing I bought the 5M packet of this. So I'll make sure I have enough here, even if I want to plant them a little thicker than that. So just like we did with the spinach, we just want to sprinkle these in a little wide band here all along this row. Make sure we get a real thick stand of these bunch of onions. It's like time is falling asleep. all right all right all right we got them in i got a little too happy with my seeds scattering there and uh run out of seeds with about that much row to go on the second part of that double row so we'll have a little empty space there but the rest of it should be planted nice and thick we'll have a bunch of bunching onions and these things should hold well throughout the winter once they get up and growing so we want to harvest them all at one time they should kind of hold well over the winter. We can just go out there and grab us a bunch when we need them and kind of just keep them right there in that same spot throughout these winter months. We'll probably use them up by, you know, late winter, early spring or so. Now, same thing with these as is the case with the carrots and the spinach. These are going to take a little while to get going. You wouldn't want to plant these in an area with some very high weed pressure because the weed's going to outpace the bunch of onions. So pick a spot where your weed pressure isn't that bad. You can grow these in a pot by the house really easily, just a little container, scatter the whole thing full of these bunching onion seeds, cover them up, have you a nice little supply right there by the door. Also, people, I've also seen people grow them in a greenhouse. Those bottom trays like we use for some of our seed starting trays would be perfect to grow you a little mess of bunching onions in. So you can grow these things just about anywhere. It'll be interesting to see how they do here in our onion plot on this outer row here. 
like I said, it's been a while since I've grown any bunch of onions, but I'm excited about having them for some soups this winter. So thanks for joining me in the garden today, getting some stuff done and getting ready to put our onions in the ground. Very, very exciting time of year. I'm glad it's going to be nice and cool when we put them in the ground. I do recall some years planting onions, been out here in shorts and a shirt and showing up sweating. It'll be nice that I don't think we're supposed to get over about 72, 73 next week. So it'll be nice, good onion planting weather. And if you've got any tips or experiences with using these alfalfa pellets on anything, but particularly on onions, please do share that in the comments below so I can learn from your experiences. If you haven't already, head on over to our website at lazydogfarm.com where we've got some nice garden recipes, some recommended products, even some cool Lazy Dog Farm merch. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well, mm -hmm, by the beauty of your life.